Hello and good morning or good evening to everyone attending to today's webcast. So first of all, let me welcome you. Um, I'm David Mauri, I'm the leader of the Application Development Virtual Group. And uh, if you're new and if this is your first, uh, your first uh, webinar, um, just a few words about the group. So uh, we aim to serve as a hub of free training and information for everything is related to the Microsoft Data Platform uh, and especially uh, uh, on topics related to um, development. Uh, development focused then on not only on just uh, .NET but any language connect that allows you to connect and work with the data platform and uh, uh, this is also true for database so we are not only focused on SQL Server uh, even if it's still the majority of uh, our webinar uh, I hope to be able to change this in uh, the near future uh, to cover also additional uh, cool technologies like uh, uh, graph uh, databases, uh, uh, document databases, and everything the cloud has to offer. Um, and we just try to share what we learn while doing our job uh, and, and provide, a, as I said before, information and training to all of our members. Uh, so let's move on. And uh, uh, as you may know, we are connected uh, with the uh, uh, PASS uh, organization. PASS is a global community. Uh, that basically uh, share the fact that they work and love uh, with the Microsoft Data Platform. Uh, so we are just one of the many group you may found uh, uh, in this organization. They can be online or offline. As you can see, there are really, really a lot of virtual groups. Uh, it can be uh, group related to specific topics like uh, data architecture or DBA or cloud or um, tied to specific language for making it uh, easier to everyone to attend to this meeting. Uh, I just remember you that uh, the PASS Summit, uh, which is the biggest uh, event uh, of uh, uh, our organization uh, and also the biggest event on SQL Server and the Microsoft Data Platform is just around the corner, so it will be in uh, a couple of weeks from now. It will be here in, in Seattle where I'm talking uh, and I just uh, really recommend you to uh, evaluate the option to participate because it's, uh, it's a week of full uh, uh, and deep learning uh, on uh, everything related to the other platform. It's very, very useful uh, from a professional point of view, from a networking point of view, so I really recommend you if you have the chance to come and attend to the, uh, to the summit. Now, uh, before talking uh, of the current meeting, uh, um, I just want to point you uh, out that uh, the next two meetings will be very interesting. So uh, the next meeting on November uh, the 8th, Dino Esposito, I'm sure you know him, will uh, uh, do a webinar for us uh, discussing uh, on a very, I would say, advanced topic like historical uh, uh, crude and application business events. So uh, be sure to uh, point this in your calendar because it's going to be a uh, really, really interesting uh, uh, webinar. And then uh, there is the reschedule of what's new in Entity Framework Core that should have been done one month ago, but for personal reason we had to uh, reschedule the event and then will be delivered uh, on November 29th. So just point them out on your calendar because they are both really, really interesting. Now what's about today's meeting? So today is going to be a little bit different than the usual one because besides being the host, uh, I will also be the presenter. I've been presenting uh, uh, since 2003, uh, if I remember correctly, and uh, I was missing presenting on a, on a user group, so I decided to share uh, something I really love to talk about with you guys. So today I'll also be um, the speaker. And what we are going to uh, talk about is just, a, I would say, a very um, special way of thinking that will allow you to um, solve some business problem uh, in a really, really performant way, even if you already have used it, uh, all your uh, cards, so you already try to optimize the database, you already apply the correct indexes, you already uh, figure it out uh, what can be optimized and what not, but still you have uh, performance that are not exactly what you want, you would just need more performance. So I think there is a couple of uh, things we can do to improve performance and this is what uh, we are going to um, discuss today. Um, I work uh, in IT since uh, 
before 2000, so it's quite a, a long time right now. I started to work on SQL Server from 7.5, and then I uh, moved on BI. I also had the passion, I always had the passion of the optimization and helping developers and, and managers to uh, get the most out of the Microsoft Data Platform. Lately, I, uh, I moved from Italy here in, in Redmond specifically, and I'm working on IoT. I'm the director of software engineering for a company called Sensoria. We are a, a startup um, working in the smart garments and the, the Internet of Me um, space. And of course, we use Azure quite a lot. I would say all our stuff is done on Azure. And SQL Server, and more, more specifically, Azure SQL is one of our uh, database that we use every day. So uh, that's my background. And uh, just a few more things about today's meeting. Uh, all the things I'm going to show you, the slides and the demos will be available online. I will put the demos on GitHub uh, and the slides will be available uh, on uh, on the uh, application development uh, virtual group uh, page along with uh, a link to the to the demos and also the video. Uh, it's, it's recorded and will be published on our YouTube channel. So let's start, uh, enough with the introduction, and let's start with the uh, presentation. So let's go here and let's discuss about this um, really, I would say, particular special topic. Uh, so I just, uh, already, I already told you what I am, so we'll just go over uh, quickly this slide. Just to mention that you have my uh, email here, my Twitter address, uh, my blog. So just uh, if you want to contact me, just use any of these and I will answer you. So I said before uh, what the session is about. Well, the session is a discussion on, and of course also a demonstration of alternative ways uh, of, solving, of solving daily problem, such in a way you will have a better code which will be easier, more maintainable, and hopefully more understandable, better performance, of course, and better scalability, all within uh, Azure SQL and SQL Server. And all within using indexes. I know you know how to use indexes, or you are uh, learning how to use them, and they are really, really a powerful, uh, a powerful uh, feature. Um, Sometimes uh, uh, it's just the way you wrote the code or the way you solve the business problem that prevent even indexes to help you. So we are go going to discuss exactly this topic right now. And in fact, we will be discussing about having a, a mind shift to just try to solve the problem in, in a different and better way. So let's start with the first problem. Uh, I call it the free space problem. Um, basically, Hopefully you can see the slide. Yeah, you should be able to see it right now. Uh, oh, just uh, one thing before going on. Since today I'm alone, uh, uh, so I will. I'm, I'm the host uh, and the uh, and the speaker. Uh, just do any question you want uh, via the go to webinar application. I will just answer them uh, at the end of the session. So let's let's move on and. Uh, Let's discuss about uh, this free space problem. So let's say you uh, you need to develop an application for a really huge warehouse, and what you have to do is just uh, make sure that if someone comes with five packages or five elements uh, or a number of elements, you can tell them, uh, you can tell the guy that has come to you, uh, okay, put all these elements in that position, because one of the requirement is that the those elements that uh, you need to store somewhere need to be uh, um, near to each other, okay? So this could be a use case for a warehouse, but also could be a use case for a, you know, ticket for stadiums, cinemas, um, uh, theaters, whatever. So uh, let's say this is the situation we have. So we have the blue are the spaces we have and the blue with the little yellow cube are the spaces that are already uh, occupied. And uh, we have to find uh, an algorithm to solve the problem that someone come to us and tell us, uh, um, I have these five boxes that I need to store all together. Where, where is the, there is enough space to store these five boxes together? And we have to solve this problem. And one of the things that usually happen, and this is a problem I uh, discussed at the 
since uh, I would say five or more years ago. When I tried to start to discuss this problem, uh, one of the questions, one of the answers that always came up is that, uh, well, that's quite an easy problem. I don't see any problem here, right? You just uh, uh, focus on the first line, and uh, and then you say, okay, as soon as you uh, find the first uh, free space, you just uh, uh, create a counter, or you just you know store the number of free space you have found so far, which is one somewhere. So we have this free space counter, and then you move to the uh, to the next space. Now, the first uh, the first space counter is in the space number three, right? So if you start to counting from the left, uh, the first free space is the uh, place number three. And now you move on the next one, and the next one is also free, and it happens to be the number four, the, 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 the space number four. And now you notice that the three and four are near to each other, or the next free space um, is just the previous one plus one, right? If this happens, so if you uh, found that two near place are uh, are available, uh, are not occupied yet, you just increase the counter you started to create at the beginning. So since 4 it's near 3 because it's just 3 plus 1, so it's n plus 1, then we can, and it's free, then we can increment the counter we set up at the beginning. And then we go on with this algorithm. So 5 is free, yes, and it's just uh, 4 plus 1, so we know that 4 and 5 are two near places, um, we increase the counter and go on. And as you can see, it works because uh, we can easily recognize that from place number three to place number seven, there are five empty boxes that, that we can use to store our thing. So this just works. Now, what happens? You, you, uh, you find uh, an occupied box and you basically reset everything and start from scratch. So you reset your free space counter and you start the algorithm uh, again from scratch. So in this case, we will just have two uh, empty boxes we can use, two empty spaces we can use, uh, uh, nine and 10. And so our counter for this specific group will be two. Now, let's see uh, how this physically work using SQL. Actually, the solution I'm describing, I just described it, uh, can be done also in C Sharp, in Visual Basic, in Java, whatever. Uh, I'm just using SQL because it's easier for, for me to just stay in within one language in the demo. So uh, let's just, uh, you know, set up the demo. Uh, I have all the scripts here. Let me zoom a little bit. Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing here is using the TempDB and I'm creating my seeds table in this case instead of a, a warehouse. I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, thinking uh, to a stadium uh, as a sample. And so I'm creating a table that contains the seeds and the row and uh, if the seeds is taken or not. So let me just uh, execute this and then I also need to generate some data, some sample data, right? Okay, so let me just generate some sample data, and this is um, this is uh, the uh, data we right now have. So the rows and the uh, seats number, where is zero means that the seat is free, and when it, there is one means that the seat uh, is already uh, occupied by someone. Just remember that right now we are not talking about that warehouse anymore, but just a, a stadium. So of course, what I want to do is. Uh, if I have, you know, a group of five people or four people coming together, and of course they want to uh, sit near each other, so they ask me, okay, we want to buy four tickets, uh, and uh, can you tell us where we can then go and sit so we can stay together? So we can, the, what we have to do is to find a group of free seats that is big enough to uh, have them seated together. So for example, we can just focus on the row number E, and as you can see here, I have some free space, for example, for from four to nine, and then I have two space, two uh, seats uh, free from 16 to 17, and go on, right? Okay, cool. So if I start to just uh, uh, implement the 
algorithm I described before in the, in the PowerPoint, it will turn out that, uh, of course, here I'm opening a cursor, but again on C-sharp I will be just using a loop, so it's really uh, uh, syntax different here, but the logic is the same. I'm iterating all over the rows and the seats um, just to, and just, you know, um, using the counter I said before, sorry, here, and increasing the counter each time I find two seats uh, free near to each other, and then resetting the counter each time I, f I find a occupied seat and starting the counter again uh, when I find a, a new free a group of seats uh, again. So all this code that you can see here, all this code is needed to implement the algorithm. Now, it's probably a little bit more than one would expect at the beginning because uh, you don't only need to take into account the fact that you have to count these rows, uh, this uh, uh, column here, but you also need to take into account that at some point you have to switch row. So you go from E to uh, G or from A to B. So you need also to reset your counter when you switch row or even when you are at the end of the column you cannot just count anymore so you have to uh, make all these checks for example uh, uh, the previous row and the current row and check if the row the previous row is different than the current one just to make sure that you correctly reset your counter in order to have your your algorithm working so this of course make everything a little bit more complex but Let's say that uh, we are happy with the code we just wrote uh, and we just want to execute this and let's see if it brings the results uh, we want. And of course it does because the code it correctly identifies that we have one group of one seat here, we have one group of six, uh, six uh, uh, free seats here, two here and so on. And so we have uh, the total free seats uh, in the group uh, and when the group starts and when the group ends. So we can easily uh, give the information to the customer that came to us and wanted to sit uh, four people together that they have to go from uh, group number from seat number four to number nine because there are six uh, free seats there. So this is how we solved it, right? So it, is it working? Uh, again, let's discuss about uh, the solution we found before moving on the next. Um, so, what are the considerations that we can uh, make of this solution? Well, is such solution the best? Well, actually, maybe it's just the first that come out our, of our mind. Uh, it probably was the easiest for us to think um, of, and we just started to implement it. We did that. We solved it a little bit corner case that we didn't we didn't thought at the beginning, like when uh, I'm switching row or um, or when I'm at the, at the end of my uh, column set, um, but it works, right? So it works, but it was not that easy as we thought at the beginning. I mean, uh, the algorithm was really easy, you know, count and add one to the counter and so on. The, 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 uh, the code at the end was a little bit more complex than uh, what we may have figured out at the beginning. As you can see, just to do this count, uh, there's a lot of uh, codes that need to be written. And again, I just want to stress out that this is true for SQL, but also for C Sharp, for Visual Basic, for any language that uh, will use a loop to solve this problem. Um, now, the other option, the other question is: Is that scalable? Huh. Well, we just tried on a very small data set. Of course, performance are good, but if you try and, and try to uh, create a data set that is uh, the overall amount of seats is 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, you will see that uh, the time this code takes to solve the problem is exponentially higher. So it doesn't scale at all because when you have, when we already have 1 million, 1 million, oops, excuse me, when you have 1 million uh, um, seats to check, it's already taking 14 seconds. Now, for a uh, for a stadium, you probably be in the safe side because you don't. I don't think we have a stadium that can hold one million person. But for a huge warehouse, one million places could probably be uh, something you have to deal uh, with. Uh, and so this solution doesn't scale. So 
let's try to figure out if there is a better solution to the problem. Uh, we may even have to put indexes, but you will learn that uh, it doesn't really uh, improve the solution just because our solution was completely procedural. So we just uh, told to the system how to uh, find the solution, how to do each step to find the solution. Now we may want to try to uh, approach in another way and one way is to try to exercise what is called the lateral thinking which basically means trying to solve the problem with some creativity and uh, I love the definition because the lateral thinking uh, is uh, defined as solving the problem through indirect and creative approach reason, using a reasoning that is not immediately obvious so we just have to think about uh, our problem right and see if we can do better and maybe achieve a linear scale or something uh, near it. So to do that let's start uh, again to go back um, to the original problem and let's focus on a row only. So it's quite clear here when we look at the row right that there are groups. Uh, by looking at the row we, we can easily identify uh, that the seats on the left uh, are in one group and the seats on the right uh, are in another group and if the database or the system could see exactly what we are seeing it would be really easy to say okay group by uh, something that we can easily see and of course the database cannot see because it doesn't see this picture right so uh, the fact that we are able to identify a group just by looking at the picture means that probably there is something that is hidden uh, uh, hidden information that it's visible to us but it's hidden to, to the database, to the machine. So we, we just need to figure out uh, how to, uh, you know, make this information emerge and then use it to group and to, so, to group the uh, seats and solve the problem. So one way to do that, for example, is that we can just say, okay, let's just give the number, give a number to all seats. So this is the first seat and then there is the second seat and the third seat and so on. Now, let's give a number only to those seats that are free, not occupied. So this will be the first free seat and then there will be, just let me highlight this, so uh, let's take a better color, okay, so this will be the first free seat, this will be the second free seat and so on, right? Now what you can do, you can just make a difference between the, count, the seat counter and the free seat counter and as you can see now, we have that hidden information available as a number. Now that we have this uh, information showing, sh showing up, we can just use it uh, as a, a grouping factor for the group by. So now we just have solved our problem. That's it. No thinking on you know counters and logic to figure out if you are at the beginning on the row at the end of the row uh, in a new row we just are uh, you know extracting extracting hidden information and using it to uh, ask to SQL Server to our database to our system to solve the problem for us so let's see how it works uh, in, re in, in reality uh, in the code um, it will be very easy because uh, all we have to do again is let's let me set up all the data from a clean situation and let me create a, oop, not here but this one sorry here okay so let me make sure that we have the correct data and let me create a procedure to load the data and then let's do the test. So let me load some a small amount of data and let's just focus on the row number five. Here instead of using letters I just use the numbers so row number five is the row E in our sample and as you can see here what I'm doing is that I have my seat number, uh, I have a row number that is the number of the uh, free seat and just by doing the difference I can you know have a grouping factor and by doing I, I do that just using the row number function here 
So it's a windowing function that is available since 2005, and, and it's also available on Azure, and it allows me to say, okay, number the seat starting from one, uh, as long as the row has the same value, uh, just uh, start counting the seat. When the row will change the value, so when we will be on the row six, start from one again. So partition by is basically saying uh, as long as the row in uh, the value in the row column doesn't change, so it's uh, always uh, the same in this case five, uh, keep ordering, uh, start, keep uh, generating a row number ordering by seat. So seat uh, one will have row number one, seat four will have row number two, and so on. Um, if I just uh, use two rows, for example, you will see that. Uh, for the row six, the row number will start again from one, right? So this is what the partition uh, by does. An order by just tell how the row number should be generated, using which value to determine who is the first and who is the second. In our case, we just want to use the seed. So now, what we have to do is just uh, remove the filter on the rows and just say, okay, I'm generating all these grouping keys for all the rows, and then I'm just grouping by the row and the group key, and that's it. And of course, I'm doing the min and the max to get the uh, starting free seat and the ending free seat, and then also doing uh, just uh, addition or subtraction to count how many seats there are in that, in that group. And that's it. We have the solution, which is way more elegant. Uh, way simpler to understand, and uh, it just works. Now we just have to figure out if it works better, so it's more as more performance and it scale better than the previous one with the row or not. But as you can see here, we completely change the way to solve the problem. Instead of telling the system step by step what to do, following a procedural approach. We just leverage the fact that, for example, we know that the database is good in working with sets, and so we figure out a way to make the uh, grouping key information emerge so that they can be used as a set in order to group by thing. And uh, so let's try to benchmark the, uh, the solution. And so I'm creating again uh, all my sample data and sample objects. And now let's do the benchmark on the row by row. And here I'm uh, simulating a, a warehouse or a uh, other thing where we have 100 rows and 30,000 seats per row, okay? And I also want to, for now, disable the parallelism. So I will ask to SQL Server to database not to execute the query in parallel in the case if it thinks it, this could, uh, could help. So let's load the data. So everything will be used, uh, will be done using one processor only. And uh, so as soon as the data is ready, okay, okay. Let me just execute the row by row solution. The story procedure here just contains the code you saw before. And let's see how much does it take. It should take more than ten seconds, between twelve and fourteen. And maybe now it's taking a little bit more. Come on. And well, at some point uh, he, he will finish. You know, it's just taking too much. So probably there is not something not going on. But as you can see, the the point here is that. Uh, um, yeah, let me just try again to make sure that everything is working. As expected, uh, it should take something between 10, 12, and 14 seconds. So let's see what's going on here. Let me close the other stuff just to make sure there is no interference. Okay. And let's try this again. So it should be finished, as I said before, in something between 12 and 14 seconds. If it doesn't, uh, no problem. Okay, there is something going on here, uh, but that's not a problem. I mean, it's just taking way too much. Now, 
let's just try to use exactly the same data so I'm not going to execute this again but now I'm going to um, execute the set based uh, solution right so let me go here and I won't load new data so we just use exactly the same data as before and this should be finished in uh, uh, just uh, really a couple of seconds as you see in six seconds uh, we had the answer with the other uh, we didn't even have the answer it took too much time right so this scale much better much 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 better and so we just have a simple situation, a simple solution, uh, easier to understand, with less code written, which means less bugs, uh, and also faster. Now the beauty of this is even that now we can re-enable the parallelism, it took six seconds, without parallelism enabled. Now if we re-enable parallelism, we could expect this to finish even faster, even earlier. It should be faster because it can take advantage of the fact that SQL Server is able to split execution among more than one processor, all the way, all the one I have. And in fact, it took only four seconds, which is more or less 50% of the one, uh, 60% uh, of the one we uh, did before, without any code intervention. So I can just using this approach where I don't tell the system step by step what to do, but I just describe the solution using uh, the function and the declarative approach that a SQL database allows me to use, I can even just leverage all the optimization that are inside the database for me that will make my query scale much more, uh, in a scale uh, much better and also have better performance if it can use more than one processor. Now this is really important especially in Azure because this means that you just are going to pay less for the resources you use because you will use them for less time you stress them uh, less than what uh, for example uh, the row solution row by row solution will do and thus you need probably a smaller uh, a smaller level of database uh, which means that you are going to spend less still having the same performance or even better uh, so this little uh, solution showed us that if we try to think out of the box or use this lateral thinking approach, so just try to see the, um, uh, not, not stop at the first uh, uh, solution, but just try to see another one or, you know, using some creativity. In this case, we, uh, we had to extract the information out of the, out of the hidden data that was inside our, our data it can really uh, pay off. Code is so much simpler and performance and scalability are vastly improved as, as you saw. One didn't even finish, finish the other with all the optimization enabled finished in three seconds. Um, so it seems hard, yes it seems hard because at the beginning everything is hard, right? Everything is hard, it's difficult. And if you remember when you were a kid, you know, just crawling was so easy and fun. But then when you grow up and you want to win a, a competition, you just have to, you know, train and train and train so that you can, so that uh, all the movement, all the, uh, um, all the thing that needs to be done in order to, you know, go faster in our case, uh, will come automatically without even thinking, right? So the only way to improve uh, this uh, approach is just trying to exercise as much as possible. So let's also do some exercise. Uh, so you can see different approach of this um, different way of thinking. So one of the problem I had to solve in the last uh, in the in the um, some work I did a couple of years ago was to um, try to generate all the um, all the rates for a loan. Of course, I've been given the formula to calculate the interest, but basically the, sor the source table was just, uh, you know, the loan value, the number of rates, the payment frequency, and the interest, and that's it. And what they asked me is to generate for all the loans they uh, were uh, serving, all the rates that they should expect to receive from 
when the law starts up to the future when the when the law ends and of course the solution was implemented using an iterative approach just more or less like the uh, row by row solution we saw before so there was uh, data was taken out of data from the database uh, move it into a uh, at that time was a visual basic application a number were crunched using a loop over loop over loop uh, and and then everything was uh, sent back to the database and the application took like hours and hours to to finish and of course this was not uh, uh, was not something that they uh, really liked so they asked me to try to figure out a, a way to improve the solution and just to have it in hopefully uh, you know less than one hour or minutes and so this is what we what we have to do uh, you take the loan value you calculate the rate you know the rate you know the payment frequency and you have to calculate all the rate and uh, uh, and when they should be uh, paid. Again, this is a simplification of the original problem, but it it's helpful to uh, to have something uh, to use as a you know training uh, exercise. So let's let's uh, try to solve this uh, together again. So let's set up uh, uh, the data for the demo. And let me generate some data. Well, data is few here, so it's easy to see. Okay, so this is our data, just exactly the one I shown in the PowerPoint. So we have the start date and the end date of the loan, the total value, the interest rate, and the payment frequency. And uh, set based the solution is quite uh, easy so first of all first of all we need to figure out if we are able to generate rows for each rate um, so to solve the problem what we can do is try to generate numbers for us for example and this is why having a function or a um, or a table just of numbers could be really really handy because let's say I have just now numbers from 1 to 100 uh, let's move into correct database so let's say I can have a table or something that generates number from 1 to 100 right well I can use this number as days instead of numbers because if I just uh, add the start date of a payment and some calculation to figure out when uh, the payment should be done depending on the rate frequency and the fact that maybe the payment should always be at the end of the month I can just turn this n number into a payment date so let's try to do that for example for all my uh, yes sorry I'm not using uh, the table that I showed you before I'm just using now some sample data so let's say if the start date the end date and the payment frequency this is what I can get with a, a numbers table as a support for my query so I can generate as many numbers as I want in order to make sure that I will cover from the start date to the end date and then calculate the payment date and just keep uh, the data I'm interested into of course the trick here is to create a correct uh, uh, where clause where you show your date will be will just stay within the start and the end date of your loan otherwise this would have generated a hundred dates right from the start date it will have generated a hundred dates okay now this is exactly not we want because we don't want all the date after the loan has been repaid we just want to stop when the loan end and that's why we put a, a where clause between start and end and that's it so using an additional number table that it's really easy to create in this case it's, it's not even a table it's a function uh, we can basically generate as many rows as we want just like if uh, we would be using a, a, a loop but without using a loop we just we are just declaring uh, uh, that we want to uh, use this number to make this calculation now now the trick is how can I instead of using variables here take this information out of the source table well it's just a join because uh, uh, in the source table let me show it in the source table we just have uh, the start date and the end date we don't have the uh, number of rates which is useful for us to, to know how many numbers to generate so 
we just, uh, first of all, generate here the number of months for uh, which we need to generate uh, the, the the rate potentially, and then we exactly calculate the number of rates uh, depending on the payment frequency, and then we just join all our, our tables to this numbers table. And the join is not a usual equi-join, it's a little bit more complex because it's a join between the generated date and the start and the end date. So it's a kind of, a, um, you know, I call it a exotic join because it's not something you will typically see but it's very, it's very powerful. So it's not an equi-join, it's just a join between the start date and the end date and the date we calculated for uh, that loan to be repaid in that month. So if we do that, this will answer really in seconds, even less, for all the loans we have, we will just have the number of rates, the value of each rate, and the payment date for that rate. So this is another way to show you, in this case we even added a new table, we created a new table with numbers, so the creative part and the you know not so obvious part of the lateral thinking is here, and then we use that to generate all the rows that were needed to solve the problem without using a loop, without using a cursor, without moving data out of database into a more uh, general and maybe powerful language like C sharp. Everything is in database and everything is amazingly fast here because in uh, uh, at the end of the engagement in just a couple of seconds the bank could have the report for any uh, for any any rate any loan and whatever they were interested to so this is again the the clue part here the main part here is to you know this join that is completely different than the normal equi join you are used to see and the generation of number that support us uh, with having one row for each uh, rate we have to we have to generate um, via this numbers table or numbers uh, function. Any uh, there are any other uh, other example here? Uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, so, for example, another typical problem is to um, especially now with the IoT thing going on, is that you have a, a list of machine statuses, like your machine is A, B, and C, and of course they report statuses uh, at every second, let's say, right? So machine A was in standby at time uh, 1001, machine B was in standby at time 1001, and so on. At some point machine D started working and machine A started working and so on. Now, what you have to do is, for example, just uh, create a report or show in an application the value, <coughs> the last value reported by each machine. So you're just interested in the last one, right? Oh, this seems to be quite easy, but again, uh, if you just think in the, let's say, uh, common way or the easiest approach, uh, it's probably uh, you probably resource to a loop, saying okay I can just take the, all the values for my machine A and just uh, you know go all over them until we find the last one. Uh, let's see how this works with uh, our little approach. Uh, and group values. So let me set up uh, set up the solution and uh, let me generate some data. I will just generate uh, quite a bunch of data here and uh, let's try some solution. I will just uh, show a couple of them but in the script you have many many more just to show you different ways you can solve the problem. Some are better, some are worse, uh, but so you can exercise on that. So let's uh, first of all take a look at the machine ID reported from machine one. So machine one has been in status M, then I, then M, then I, and so on, and this is our, the period in which uh, this machine reported in which status it was. Now to um, to get the latest status value for each machine, one option could be, let's just take uh, all the distinct machine IDs and then for each of them using uh, 
the cross apply function that basically allows you to call a sub query for each row you have in the outer query so I will just use 23 to which is my first machine ID for example to select top one so select the first value order it ordered by date descending and taking the the status which basically this means take the last status of that specific machine right because I'm filtering with the machine ID that is coming out from this query so this is sort of loop because for each machine ID I'm calling this subquery it's not written as a loop because of course we are just leveraging a set basic approach with uh, cross apply it works pretty well so for example for each machine I have uh, my last status but performance is not that good I mean we did 2000 logical reads so this means that SQL Server had to access data for two, uh, more than 2,000 times, which, which is it's okay. It's a lot or, or not, this number. Well, let's see how big is our table, right? So if I just read all my table, how many reads I have to do to read all my table? Well, just six. So with six reads, I can read all my table. But to answer the problem using this approach with the cross apply and the select top one is, is in within the cross apply, <clears throat> it takes 2,000 reads, which is like uh, you know a huge amount more than just reading the whole table. So this because this happened because we are reading the table more and more. So each time we do the cross apply, we read the table. Then we change the machine ID and we we read the table again, filtering that machine. Now, of course, you can put a index here to speed up this search, but still it will be a lot of scan count and logical reads as a result. So another option is again to use our friend row number and partition by machine ID and order by date, and this will basically uh, create number for the rows so that uh, number one will be assigned to the oldest uh, to the oldest row right so let's try doing this yeah okay sorry to uh, this is descending yeah so this will be to the uh, newest row inserted not the oldest sorry and so basically this answer our question because here we are saying, okay, this is my machine ID, right? What is the last row reported? This one. And how can I quickly identify the last row reported by this machine? Because it has number one now. And so I can just apply this logic to all machine using just a partition by, as we did before, and then that's it. So I just calculate the row number for all machine using the logic of giving the row number the uh, smallest number to the uh, newest row so I know that the newest row the last row will be always marked with n equal 1 and then I can just filter the data that's it this will help me to answer the problem in just exactly six reads so I'm just reading the table once and while I'm going through the table, I'm also figuring out if that row is something that is interested to me or I have to discard it, based, basing on this new column I created. Again, creativity here because I'm extrapolating information out of the existing one and putting them uh, uh,
can you hear me back now? Uh, hopefully, uh, I just noticed now that there are some problem with audio iPad. Yes, uh, I think uh, for 10 minutes you didn't hear my voice. So it was just the last, uh, uh, it was just the last example, hopefully. Um, so luckily, well, the session will be recorded. Um, and no, I wasn't muted. Uh, I think that the USB had some problem, unfortunately, or the the GoToWebinar application because it was stuck, but I couldn't show it because I was uh, doing the demo. So I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, so let's see some question here. Which book would you recommend to help us building this sequel lateral thinking skill? So definitely one of the uh, go and buy one book that talks about window function because there's a lot of uh, power in there and we allow you to develop this kind of uh, uh, ability. So there is a book called SQL Server Window Function uh, written by a friend of mine, Itzik Bengan. So this is surely a book I, I uh, advise you to recommend you to uh, to buy and that's it so recording will be uh, will be hopefully with with the additional missing piece will be available on YouTube uh, in the next day will you will receive an email with all the details on how to download the slides the demos and uh, and a link to the YouTube uh, um, the YouTube video uh, any other question Okay, thank you so much guys for attending and see you in the next uh, webinar one month from now. Bye-bye.